Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to Voices. Uh, in today's episode, we're gonna be doing what I'm gonna start calling the Horror Fast Five, which is gonna be a video that contains five things under whatever topic we are talking about. Um, and today's it's gonna be um, my, my sort of top five picks, I guess, for um, horror that has influenced me over the years. So originally when I made this list, it was a lot more than five. So I had to really, really, really think about ones that I thought were worth talking about. And a few of them I removed off my original list because I'm going to be talking about them in the video that's the following, that's this next week coming up after this video comes out. Um, so I thought, well, I'm gonna be talking about them anyway. I'll just take them off this list. So yeah, so we're gonna talk about five pieces of horror that have influenced me over the years. Um, some of them are just things that made me think about horror differently, made me appreciate different pieces of the genre that maybe I didn't before, were kind of my introductions into subgenres, kind of like a mixed bag here. So we're gonna start with my first one, which is uh, Frankenstein 1931. Um, basing this solely off the film, as a film, um, so I'm a big fan of Frankenstein. Frankenstein's monster is uh, one of my favorite old school monsters. I mean, he's like the centerpiece of my wall that one day I will be filming in front of again when I get this room together. Um, and um, and it's for it's for it's for quite a, a few reasons. Um, I think you can get into the symbolism in Frankenstein and you can talk about what it means and what it says, but I think it's core things for me that really just made me appreciate monster movies and is kind of like my, my favorite of the original monsters. Um, is I really like, and I've talked about this in previous videos before, I really like when horror assesses pieces of humanity that we don't necessarily always talk about. And one of the big pieces of this is, you know, Dr. Frankenstein's desire to to play God, right? Um, he's like the OG God complex character where that's absolutely what he's trying to do. Um, and it's so interesting because I, I was uh, thinking back on like pieces of it that I remember watching and how it impacted me. And I remember, <laughs> I remember the scene where the normal brain gets dropped and instead he's given the uh, abnormal brain. And just, I remember this moment of, oh no, what does that mean? But it's just interesting because I think there's a lot of themes in this concept of light equaling like intelligence and enlightenment as far as like science and moving forward and kind of getting out of superstitions. And, um, and I like a lot of those kind of themes. Um, I think I also really like that Frankenstein's monster is a bit of a social pariah and I, I kind of just felt really, really bad for him, which I think is kind of common. Um, and it's like that in, in quite a few others that I have seen as well, but as Frankenstein being the fir Frankenstein, the movie being the first one, um, that kind of introduced me to monster cinema. I feel like it's one of those things where it just kind of gave me like a broader appreciation for that. Um, I definitely like, it's like when I saw King Kong for the first time, the, the original, I can't even watch the new one. Cause it like the, the one with Adrian Brody, just like, I, I can only watch it up until they capture him. And then I can't watch it anymore. It, it like breaks my heart. Um, but the, you know, I remember seeing that for the first time, which was actually as far as my timeline goes, was after I had actually seen um, Frankenstein for the first time. And I just remember feeling so sorry for him. Creature of the Black Lagoon's kind of the same way. You know, like you just, there's something about the way the story builds around Frankenstein's monster where you just like, you want to fix it, I guess. I don't really know how else to explain it. Um, but it was kind of, um, yeah, it was kind of like my intro into... Um, into monster cinema, I guess. Um, I also really liked this concept of, of wanting to be like there, you know, aside from the God role, there's also like a father role, right? Cause he's like, he made him, he was part of his, like how he was created. I don't know. Like, I think some of those themes are really interesting in general. Um, when you look into dissecting them and breaking them down on what they actually mean, especially considering the time frame that it came out. Um, so Frankenstein 1931 is, is one of my influential horror pieces. Um, and I'm actually going in order of uh, when they were released. So my next one, which I've talked about briefly before, is going to be uh, Poltergeist, which was my is my first memory of life. Um, I remember seeing. I was about. I had to have been three or four when I saw it, which would have made me or would have made it. Let's see, it came out in '82. I was born in '88, so it was a little. It was kind of older by the time I had seen it, but. Um, 
it was sort of, it's interesting because I remember being terrified when I watched it. Um, but then I had seen it so many times since then, even as a small kid, um, my siblings snuck and like got me to watch it and I was terrified and it was a whole thing. But it was sort of like my introduction into the supernatural, the ghosts, like, um, and because it was the first movie I'd ever seen as far as horror goes, um, it also, I think, played a huge role in my interest in in horror at all. Like, I think it, it played such a vital role in that. Um, it also, I also think a lot of people, when you ask them, like, oh, like, if you're scared of clowns, like, why are you scared of clowns? So many people say it, and not enough people say that damn doll from Poltergeist. The clown doll, absolutely not. Like, that was, that was horrifying. That was probably one of the scariest things, especially because I was born in the late 80s, and by the time I was a little bit older into the 90s, like, Toys like that, they still looked like that. They were still that horrifying. So I think um, Poltergeist was kind of like my introduction to my fear of clowns or my discomfort with clowns, um, as well as like just getting into the genre in general and um, really liking, you know, paranormal, supernatural type things. So my next one is... <laughs> so many people hate this movie. And I know, I think I talked about it before with... Um, I don't remember if it was controversial horror. Maybe it was controversial horror. Uh, but anyway, um, was Blair Witch Project. The Blair Witch Project from um, 1999. So initially, when the Blair Witch Project came out, um, it was believed to be uh, real. And of course, not everyone believed that. But there were definitely people, you know, these, these people, these actors that were in it, um, they stayed out of sight. Like, they kind of remained hidden. Like, they wanted to really drive home this fact that this was real, you know, um, and I think that knowing that is really interesting. I think that because like, um, I was like, I really, and I talked about ghost, ghost watch, um, when I did controversial horror, I'll put that like up here somewhere. Um, when I, uh, when I watched that, the impact that media in general has on society is insane. I recently posted on Facebook that I was listening to um, the original broadcast of War of the Worlds, which, although I had read it, and I, of course, have seen the the movies, I have I had never, up until this point recently, I had never listened to it, but I absolutely, like, listening to it can understand how it caused, like, worldwide panic. Like, I can see it, like, or countrywide panic, I should say. Like, it makes sense. And so, knowing that, you know, the people who did the Blair Witch Project went into this with this concept that this was real, they were gone, no one ever heard from them again. Like, that's a very uneasy thing to think about when you go to watch something. So I can see that being a part of it. But I actually did not watch the Blair Witch Project until it was already known that it was a hoax. So this was years after the fact. Um, and the Blair Witch Project was actually my first found footage movie, which, um, you know, a lot of people, I've talked about this before too, don't really like the found footage subgenre of horror. It's one of my favorites. I love found footage films. I have seen good ones. I've seen horrible ones. I've seen phenomenal ones. Um, it's like one of my favorite things. If I see that a horror film is found footage, like I'm guaranteed to watch it. I love found footage films. And The Blair Witch Project was my introduction into that subgenre and getting like this concept of like, this makes this feel very, very real. Um, and I think the other thing is it, I, and I, I've always kind of had a thing for like not so happy endings. Um, I tend to like endings that are uh, pretty obscure or really stretched or sad or unhappy. It's like, I, I like that they're not fairy tale endings. Um, we're one of very few countries that feels the need to make our movies that way. There's a lot of horror from a lot of other places that is not like that. And so I love when we push those boundaries here because no one wants that. Everyone wants everything to be like peachy keen. Um, but I love that this didn't have a happy ending. And it was probably at the time that I was really getting into like found footage and just in general, like more and more into the horror genre and film and TV shows and stuff. I feel like this was one that really kind of made me go, I really like that that didn't have a happy ending. I really liked that a lot. And the other thing that I think the Blair Witch kind of taught me is to appreciate simplicity in film, such as things like practical effects 
and um, just relying on the story and the actors to create the atmosphere. You know, there was, yes, they're in the woods in the middle of the night and that, that creates atmosphere as well, but you're not talking about a lot of jump scares. You're not talking about a lot of creatures. You're not talking, like you never see this concept of the Blair Witch, right? You never see what's causing it. It's subtle noises in the woods. It's getting lost and not being able to find your out, find your way out, which would cause insane amount of panic. Um, and you know, finding those sticks and the little, like the banging on the tent, like all of those little tiny moments that literally anybody could replicate with a camera in the woods. Like anybody could do that, but it was just done and pieced together so well that it just created an overall sense of unease. And I think that it made me just appreciate those pieces of it and, and noticing them in other films as well, which is actually part of the reason I really like found footage films because a lot of times they do rely on things like that. Um, but that was another really big reason that I thought The Blair Witch was kind of an influential horror piece for me. Um, it just kind of made me look at things a lot different in terms of, um, like I said, like practical effects and, and, and atmosphere and what it meant to feel uncomfortable even when you're safe. Um, and I really like that about it. And I think it also, I mean, the other big piece to that too, of course, is it taught me that story matters, that what you're, you know, there's so many things these days that rely on nostalgia or rely on like um, when I did the video games, um, you know, there was one of the games where the mechanics were so clunky, it was so dark, you couldn't see anything. And they, they relied solely on that to make you afraid, you know, and then there's the really, you know, the cheesy jump scares and the, like, there's so much of it now, or like the over the top CGI. And at its core, it has a terrible story, the thing or doesn't make sense or, you know, so it, I really think it kind of drove home that like this concept of a story matters when you're talking about making a horror film that it's not just about being scared it's not that simple it's a super complex concept um which i think the blair witch project did really well in general so there's that one so uh, my next one is um a slightly more newer more newer <laughs> a slightly newer one um it's not that new and now and now, oh my god now that i think about what year it is holy cow so saw the original saw the first saw came out in 2004 which I'm going to be honest with you, I did not remember that it came out in 2004. It feels like that was a really long time ago. It is so long ago. Oh, my God. So um, anyway, so Saw is another one um, that kind of influenced, like, my perception of horror and what I liked. I think Saw is probably the first, I would say, like, gore fest of a movie that I saw. Of course, keeping in mind, of course, that when Saw came out, I was a freshman in high school. So I was only 15. Ish. No, if it came out in October, so I would have been, I would have been 16 by the time it came out, the end of the year of uh, 2004. So I was 16. Either way, pretty young. Um, and I didn't have a lot of exposure to a lot of over the top gory, gory movies. I had very strict parents. Um, I wasn't allowed to watch and, and like and my sister had to sneak me to see horror movies with her when I stayed at her house and stuff because my parents were just very particular about what I was allowed to see and have access to as a kid, even as a teenager. Um, but this one, this one like stuck with me a long time after I saw it. I remember, um, I just watched Spiral the other day and I remember saying like, I remember sitting on my couch watching Saw for the first time, never seen it before. And I'm watching it and I'm so into it. And then there's that moment at the very end of the movie where he gets up off the ground. And I literally slid out of the couch onto the floor and like sitting up, but like just kind of like, oh my God, like melting onto the ground in astonishment because it was such a huge twist. No one saw it coming. It was talked about for so long after it first came out, which kind of set the bar really, really high for the ones that followed and they, they didn't really meet it, but that's a conversation for another day. And, um, it was really good. And I think it was one of the first times, at least that I can remember being that young, um, that I really sided with the bad guy. The bad guy made sense. You know, what he was doing made sense. There was logic, you know, and, um, and I actually got into this, a discussion with someone not that long ago about Saw being torture porn and all the reasons that I don't believe that that's what it is. Um, hostile, yes, but not Saw. Saw has a very, like, to me, has a very 
like specific goal in mind and the way that it makes you think about the world and how people can go on with their lives and how it affects other people and like that sort of mentality of like what is your life worth when you've already done all these other things that have that have seemingly been a waste and you know as the storyline moves on into the sequel and and you know it goes on and like just keeps moving forward there becomes this knowledge that there is no longer a way to get out of these traps that you are in fact stuck to die no matter what and like a lot of people are like well yeah and then they can't even get out it's like yeah that's the point because you take an idea that someone has and no matter how much they teach preach or drive that fact home whoever does it next is going to change it into what they want it to be and I think that's a very important distinction between the first one and some of the other ones but Saul was one even at 16 years old that just like really made me think and it was one of the first horror movies that I had seen where it was super over the top gory and that was when I learned that I do like gore like I, I do like stuff like that like I you know I didn't have a lot of exposure to it before and um it kind of set the precedent for a lot of movies that I've seen since then um and just an appreciation for um for gore in general where it has like a time and a place for that so so yeah and I think it also does um a really good job of having a point to the horror you know you're not talking about a slasher um or you know some I mean, some of those had like, you know, like Michael Myers has a, a point in theory, um, you know, Jason's mother coming, coming back and avenging the, you know, hit her son, like, okay, cool. We get it. But like, this was a very different point to what was happening. And also like, even that, so the budget for Saw, the original Saw was $1.2 million. Yes. That's a lot of money, but it still technically falls on a lower budget for a film. Um, and then I know like the second one, it like doubled and then like the budget for it just kept getting bigger as the movies went on. But um, they just did so good with like one room. Like there's pieces of it that happen in other parts, but they just did so much to make it as good as it was with only like a couple of spaces. And I think that was super well done too. But I actually really love Saw. And I've seen, I think, all of the ones, all of the movies in the franchise, even though a lot of them are not very good. Which leads us to our last one, number five, uh, which is Your Next, which came out in 2011. So I recently watched, or I'm sorry, I recently listened to a horror podcast called What a Scream. Um, I have shared her on Facebook, I believe. Um, I really like her approach to discussions about horror. I'll probably link her, uh, her podcast and maybe her Twitter below. Cause she's, I know she's on both. I follow her on Twitter. That's how I found her. And, um, so one of the things that she talked about in one of her previous episodes from like two or three weeks ago now, um, was this concept of the final girl and she had a guest and they went back and forth and they picked like their final girl that they wanted to talk about, what it meant for them, why they chose them, that kind of stuff. And then also breaking down what the concept of a final girl does for feminism in a modern sense. And if it helps or hurts the concept of feminism and just kind of breaking down what the traditional, you know, final girl is or was really. Um, and it kind of started making me think about it. And so I did my final girl crushes back in February. Um, and I, um, I, this girl was on my list and it's Erin from your next. And one of the reasons that I love her so much is because she is a hundred percent, not your typical final girl for a multitude of reasons. One, she's, more feminine than some of them have been as well as being an adult so she's not some young teenage girl that even though you may want to be attracted like you're not really like if I'm I think that makes sense what I'm trying to say um and then you know she's also um so her story her background with her fiance are they engaged I can't remember boyfriend is that she was his student which adds this like sexual level to her character, which typically final girls are not very sexual. They're usually virgins or outcast or blah, 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 blah. But that, that concept is changing as more and more final girls are not really like that anymore. And so it added that element. 
She had this super weird background. Um, and then she also kicks ass the entire movie. And so Your Next was probably the first um, kind of fun horror that I saw as well. So um, a fun horror just being um, not really like parodies or like funny, like funny horror stuff. Like, you know, um, what's the one that makes fun of Scream? Scary Movie. I don't like parody horrors like that. They are not my cup of tea. I am not a fan. Um, but as I talked, like, as I mentioned, like, stuff like Willy's Wonderland and the Banana Split Show, like, those those are fun horror, but they're done really well. They're not silly. They're not comedies. Like, there's a difference, I guess. And this was a fun movie. Um, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It is a really good one. You're next. It's like a... I don't know if it's streaming anywhere. I think the first time I watched it, I rented it because someone had suggested it to me, but it was super good. Um, and then, yeah, so Erin is just a badass the entire movie. And some of her kills, they are so good, <laughs> which kind of rolls into the whole, like, appreciation for gore stuff. And um, But I, I love her character so, so, so much. And she is not a typical final girl. But she is a final girl. And so I really liked the change of this concept of what a final girl looks like in a more modern horror scenario. Because they're not these little, like, weak, runaway, you know, virgin, like, cover-up-to-your-neck kind of women. They're strong and empowering, and they kick ass. And I loved that about her. She is one of probably one of my favorite characters from most horror things that I've seen, especially in the last decade like I just really loved that movie and I really loved her and her background and everything it was so well done um and I think that I also I mean she also does um like a really good job of of this transition of you don't know anything about her and then you're like wait a minute why can you do all this stuff why do you know all this stuff I don't know I just thought it was really well done but I, I love what she has changed for me in what I think of a final girl as like being able to find a strength in a female character like that was super meaningful to me because most of the time it's kind of a gray area about what you should actually think of the concept of a final girl. If you should be insulted and you should be proud, like it is one of those kind of things where it's kind of weird. Um, oh, and of course it has, um, Barbara Crampton in it. I love her. Um, but yeah, so those are my, uh, my five influential horror films that I feel like have really shaped what I look for in the genre, the way I think about horror, um, where some of my opinions come from. So, you know, maybe you like some of the ones I named. Maybe you never thought about some of that the way that I thought about it, or think about it rather. Um, maybe it just gives you a little insight into how my brain works when I look at horror. But um, yeah, that's my thoughts on those five things those five movies the list really was long I really had to limit it because I was like no I need to limit it or the video will be six hours because I have so many that I just pick like can pick apart and pick things that just like really have shaped me and the way that I look at things and um all in generally good ways maybe in some not so good ways but anyway well let me know what uh some horror influence influential horror movies um, some movies that, you know, influenced you, whether it's something that impacted your life personally or something that shaped how you look at the genre. Um, I feel like everybody has this one movie that they remember as just like their aha moment of, I love horror. Like it was just the one movie that just really pushed them into this point of, um, of wanting to keep watching the genre. Um, and my one movie is Poltergeist because it was the first one that I ever saw and it was the only it was the only one that I had seen multiple times before I was really old enough to start watching more horror films so let me know what yours was I'm curious everybody has such different ones it'd be interesting to see um that's all I have for this one so hope you guys enjoy the rest of your week and have a great weekend and I'll see you in the next one